Good afternoon. We'll call the meeting to order. This is the Tuesday, June 21st, 2016 work session of the Marion City Council. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Um, where do we start? Finance? Come forward. Thanks. Hello, Mayor Nick, council members and staff. Whoops, I forgot to say who I am first. <laughs> do you need all of Please that? I'm Lynette yourself. Brunzel, 1825 Bloomington Road, Marion, Iowa. I'll start again. <laughs> Hello, M Mayor Nick, council members and staff. The Sisters Cement Centennial Motorcycle Ride will be coming to Marion July 11th. 100 women riding Indian motorcycles will leave New York on July 4th and travel across Iowa on their way to San Francisco to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the transcontinental ride of Adeline and Augusta Van Buren in 1916. Ad Addie and Guthy Van Buren, distant relatives of our eighth president, were avid motorcyclists intent on promoting the war preparedness movement before World War I. And demonstrating the capacity of women to serve as military dispatch riders, they also wanted to support the suffragettes' cause. <coughs> Two charities will be supported with the funds raised by the Centennial Riders, Final Salute Incorporated, and the Women's Coalition of Motorcyclists. Final Salute is a national women's veterans organization which provides temporary and permanent housing for over 500,000 homeless female veterans in the United States. The Women's Coalition of Motorcyclists is an organization providing funds for motorcycle training that will help enlarge the number of female motorcyclists, instructors, and co coaches. The sisters' riders are expected to pass through Marion singly and in groups from 3 to 5 p.m. on Monday, July 11th. They are not expected to stop in a large pod but we hope to organize an appropriate greeting. The American Legion Auxiliary will help with flags. Additional assistance will come from local motorcycle clubs. I don't believe Wayne is here from the president of the Cedar Valley Indian Motorcycle Club or Sheila Crooksley, the director of the Chrome Divas. Um, they will be escorting the riders from Highway 30 and 13, Highway 151 and 13, and from City Park to North on 10th to County Home Road, <coughs> west to the official ride hotel in Clarion, Cedar Rapids, Clarion in Cedar Rapids. We officially request a proclamation that on July 11, 2016, to be declared Ride Your Motorcycle to Work Day in the city of Marion, and the residents are urged to show their support for the Sisters Centennial Motorcycle Ride by welcoming the riders into the city from 3 to 5 p.m. in City Square Park. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Questions? Sorry? Overnight stay in Cedar Rapids? Yes. I've asked them to stay in Mary, and I said the micro hotel is wonderful as well as Long Branch. <laughs> so I've done my part since March uh, to promote our city. But yeah. I'll take any, any additional information. Couldn't help but notice, Mayor, the TV right in the date and time bar. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been in contact with the chief of fire, and she said she was going to contact the police, but you were kind of busy with Harry Dorchey's party. <laughs> okay, so if you need anything, I can come. Thank you very much for presenting today. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Do you know what kind of motorcycle they rode? Were they, do you know what kind of motorcycle they were riding? Indian. They were Indian. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you can tell by the review. They were the toughest, heaviest bikes. The tires themselves were tougher, mm -hmm. um, so they expected to make it all the way, and they did. And they even took a little joy ride down to Mexico and back. Oh, those were made in Wisconsin? Is that? Um, currently, they're made in um, Waterloo, I'm thinking, or... Oh. Clear, Clear Lake, Iowa, excuse me. Clear Lake, Iowa is what they're being oh, made right okay. now. 
We're hoping to do a special tour of um, folks maybe here in this area to do a one-way trip there to see the actual factory and then come back here to this locale. Oh, that'll be nice. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Ready for finance? Yes, sir. Um, it's not starred, but number four, Your Honor, uh, approving the renewal of the ICAP insurance policy. I just bring that up because Jim Boschlag, our, our rep, is here. If one would have any questions, um, he would be willing to an, you know, answer those. The, the premium came in just very slightly above last year, so it's just almost negligible. But Does our insurance expert have a Oh, I got a lot question. of questions for Jim, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask them somewhere else. <laughs> Any questions on, on this? How that is that is the market right now. Jim is doing a good job. I hate to give him credit when he's here, but that's uh, that is the market for insurance, and he's found it, and we're using it. Okay. The next item, Your Honor, it's carryover of certain items um, from the current year to next year. You should have a one-page summary, I would think, in your packets that summarizes all the requests that we got from different departments to carry over items. These are items that ha have been budgeted in the current year, but for whatever reason, the money was not spent, so they're asking for authority to just to move those expenditures into next year. Um, I will have to come back next spring and do a budget amendment because those items were not budgeted next year. But we do this every year, and the, the list just changes, but we do this every year, so they just ask for your authority to to carry those items over. So this is, uh, we recently did that. Is that the same thing then? We Pardon? recently amended the budget. We amended the budget for a similar expenditures from the prior year. Right, so this is, next year we'll be doing that for this. Next year we'll be next spring, next March we'll be doing another budget amendment and this will be part of the reason why. Okay, I just wanted to point that out to everybody since we had a recent experience with it so everybody understands it. The other thing Thank I was going to mention too, there is for Thursday night, we're going to have to add one more resolution. It'll be um, a resolution approving a new application for a Class B beer permit with additional privileges for outdoor service and Sunday sales for the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival. I think this is for an event that's going to be out at Lau Park on June 26th. Does that sound right, Mike? So I really don't know much about the event, but Mike could probably address What's the event, those questions. Mike? Uh, it's the it's called the Freedom Ride, and it'll be out at Lau Park. and And basically, there's uh, going to be a concert uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, Airwaves, I believe, will per be performing in the afternoon this Sunday. There's three bike rides, uh, or four actually. There's a, a three or almost a four mile loop uh, around Marion. Um, there's a 25 mile loop, uh, a 50 mile loop, and then a 75 mile loop, and then everybody meets back at Lyle Park for the concert in the, in the afternoon. Uh, there'll be a bike parade in the afternoon. I believe the PD is going to be there, uh, do some safety, uh, bicycle safety with the kids that are there also on Sunday afternoon. I believe the concert starts at uh, 5.30. Good to see them doing something out here. That's yeah. great. Questions on that? But that's all I had. Okay. Parks? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, public service. Yes. You can go next, you <laughs> <laughs> we haven't heard from you in a while, so. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, regarding our items on the agenda, uh, discussion regarding solid waste fees and services, as well as the affidavit for the Cedar Rapids or the Solid Waste Agency, Mr. Haraney's here. Um, if you'd like him to speak on that, he definitely can, but I do have a couple things. Uh, like to go over with the council and turn that off there. And really, uh, item number one is more of an overview of uh, where our fees are and what those include, and uh, probably what we're going to see for this next year. Um, we, uh, talking with the Public Services Board, we might have to see a small increase uh, for solid waste services as we relate to recycling. Not a major increase because we are uh, looking to receive some subsidies from the 
Solid Waste Agency, which Mr. Rainey can speak on. Um, but uh, right now our fees are $14 per month. Uh, that, uh, that covers our, all of our solid waste fees that we perform within the city. Uh, we do a discounted rate for senior citizens. That's currently programmed at $10.50 uh, per month. And then our extra bag tags, uh, those are $1.75. And when you compare us to other cities, similar size, similar services, that's where we rank. Um, we're very competitive with our rates, uh, $14. We're at the very lowest, and you can see as it, as it goes up, uh, gets higher. Now, obviously, some of those cities provide different services. Those include automated services, leaf pickup, things like that. So it's hard to compare those services. Regardless, ours are still uh, very aggressive. So our fees, uh, they cover, obviously, our, our weekly collections, solid waste, yard waste, and recycling. Uh, we cover our costs for uh, recycling center operations. Yard waste facility operations, some uh, storm damage, really the processing of any type of tree limbs that come down. Right away cleanup, debris control. Uh, one thing that people don't know we really do is administration of uh, private waste haulers. Uh, all of those private haulers that go into the city of Marion, you have to be permitted. And so in order to be permitted, you have to have your truck inspected by our staff. You have to give us the list of locations of, of which where you're collecting as well as the condition of your containers. We inspect all of that. So uh, it can be a cumbersome burden sometimes. So all that said, that's the goal of what we try to do is uh, provide uniform solid waste control. We don't want that happening, obviously. And so um, in a cost breakdown of our services, and I apologize, that's tough to see. Most of our cost goes to the curbside collection that's sending the driver out on the route with the big truck collecting uh, the, the refuse and or recycling yard waste at the curb. That costs us about $10.91 uh, per month to do that. Uh, administrative fees, that, that is really the, all the administrative work that goes into that. That's the work that finance does for the bills, water, uh, as well as our uh, managing of the private waste haulers. Yard waste facility, about $1.41 off your bill, covers that. And then uh, recycling services, it's probably going to go up this year. Uh, right now, that about 93 cents off that uh, $14 covers those fees. Um, one thing that came up with our public services board is the Senior citizen rates uh, compared to what our total cost is to go out and actually collect the garbage. Uh, they are recommending to see some more uniformity here. Right now, we're not covering our cost uh, with that rate. And so this next July at the next board meeting, they'd like to discuss this to see if we can at least get that comparable, uh, at least covering our cost for going out and collecting these solid waste uh, for the discounted rate. So uh, again, yard waste facility, those costs cover that. Uh, recycling, uh, we're seeing a big increase in re our recycling facility. Um, on a typical Saturday, we'll get anywhere between four to 500 uh, cars that roll in there. So it's getting a, to be a very, very bu busy place. The problem with that, though, and that's why Joe's here, is that the recycling uh, markets in the next and last uh, year, probably two years, have really taken a turn for the worst. Uh, cardboard, all the stuff that you put in your recycling bin is worth a lot less money. Uh, this is the national average cardboard has gone way down as well as aluminum. We've, we've seen that go down scrap metals way down um, The only thing that's staying heavy or, or st coming back up is our uh, Polyethylenes or high-density polyethylenes. That's the only thing we're seeing uh, come back up So just for comparison uh, out of our recycle center back in 2014 we, we were getting about $80 a ton for recovered <coughs> products and for our cardboard 60 to $80 a ton um, and then our plastics Basically, we were allowed to recycle those at no cost over at uh, City Carton, which is now Republic Services. Uh, here in 2016, you can see huge decrease in, in revenues that we're getting off, $65 per ton for metals. Uh, cardboard is about a third of what it used to be worth uh, just a few years ago. And so that's probably the big kick right there uh, because a lot of these recycling plants bank on that value in cardboard when they start sorting out your recyclables because that's, that's way down that market. And then our plastics, now we really have to get, we have to pay to get rid of them now. Okay, so that we really can't take those over to our recycling <coughs> center. Uh, we have to pay to get rid of those. All the curbside recycling that we collect uh, at curbside, that goes out to the solid waste agency in their, uh, in their, in their resource recovery center. Right now the current tipping fee is, is $20 per ton. Under the new contract uh, that they uh, have, have with Republic Services, that's scheduled to go up to $85 per ton, which there is some disparity there because um, obviously that costs more to landfill. Landfilling is currently $38 a ton, whereas recycling is um, much more. 
So uh, with that said, the Solid Waste Agency is offering the City of Marion a credit uh, if we execute the affidavit on, which is uh, item number two. Uh, upon execution of that, they would uh, award the City of Marion a credit to keep our recycling fees down. That way, it's, uh, at least we can make a go at keeping our curbside recycling program intact without uh, uh, raising fees too much. So that'll bring it down <coughs> to about 34.50 per ton. <coughs> the board has approved that measure, uh, then it'll be up for council consideration. So, Joe, is there anything you wanna add? Cover most of it, you just, sure? yeah. Okay. Yeah, just a uh, background on that. So the agency has always paid for the processing of the curbside material since 1999. And uh, last year, when Republic Services was sold, our contract with City Carton also ended. So we went back out for a bid, and our last contract with City Carton, we were paying $34.50 per ton for the processing. And like you said, that's less than the tipping fee for the garbage, so that was good. We went out for bid. Republic was the only company that responded to it. They said, we want to continue to process your recyclables, but we're going to charge you that $65 per ton, that 88% <coughs> increase. Um, and for all the reasons that Ryan just stated. So uh, we, want to, we didn't want to see curbside recycling go away, especially in the smaller communities. Um, so we, we're committed to that 34.50 per ton like we had then. The, the other communities will have to pick up the other 30.50 to get up to the $65. And that's what that uh, $56,000 represents. And the $20 fee, so the, 80, the $20 fee, that's what every uh, hauler pays, the commercial that comes with. So City of Marion, private haulers that drop off recyclables, that's uh, the shipping and handling that covers our labor costs inside the resource recovery building, plus the shipping fee that we have to pay to get the material over to Republic. Ryan, do we see any change where our tipping weight is increasing or decreasing versus what uh, the general public is bringing in on their own on the weekends? or throughout the week as far as that goes? The only, the only increase you're, uh, in terms of recyclables, yeah. um, the only cr increase you're gonna see is that, you know, as our population grows, our, our uh, use of that facility grows. We're not seeing really an increase in the amount of drop-off collection. It's pretty steady. Uh, we have added things like scrap metals. Uh, we added a plastic bin. Since then, we had to take that away. You know, it cost us money to, to do that. But um, you're, you're really not gonna you're not going to see a big increase in amount of volume in recyclables at, at our facility. I'm just kind of quickly processing in my own mind, and I know the general public's thinking it as well, too. It's, you know, when it does get to these lean years where we're not finding it's profitable or it becomes more of an expenditure to us, um, will people disrespect the separating of their garbage and just start throwing it into the, the common pile, or will we see people stepping up to the plate, so to speak, and continuing to recycle that on their own. Um, it's, almost, it's almost kind of like buying our uh, betting on futures here, isn't it? You know, it's too bad we can't have a contract out there that says, well, you know, we're going to lock in contracts for um, these materials over a 12-month period as far as watching them fluctuate based on what the product, you know, what the commodities are running. Uh, how often do they change in monthly or quarterly? How often do they change that? The contract that we've negotiated with Republic will be for two years. So it's a 24-month contract. I Pardon me? How did it tie to change it monthly with that contract? Right, and that's what I was wondering what our what our deals were here. So yes, you're, I mean, it's, uh, it's a give and take, isn't it? Bottom line is we still want to try to enforce and uh, promote the recycling. That's the that's the true winner on that deal. So thank you. You're, you're nicer than I am. Uh, how much money could we save if we stop recycling and put it all in the landfill and fill that dump up and let it move somewhere else? Well, I wouldn't recommend stopping recycling. They're, they're all... How much money would we save? Uh, it'd be, be hard to guess. be um, a lot. The yeah, price difference is a lot. So our, our job here is to, to recycle as much as we can. Now, um, there's alternatives that we're considering. And that I've but if people don't want the cardboard, don't want the plastic, why put it in the it's landfill? Yeah, I think there's a landfill ban on cardboard. There are... Uh, yeah. Cardboard is banned from the landfill. Right. Every community in Lynn County banned it so back in 1999, and we've been tasked with enforcing it since then. So land cardboard cannot come into our landfill. Yeah. So I'll, I'll address that if you give me a second. So I'll go to the next. Did okay. you have a question? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, the the rate changing for um, the senior citizens, you know, there has not been an increase mm -hmm. in uh, uh, COLA, cost of living, with Social Security for what, two years, three years? And 
also like Ipers, uh, we know, you know, it's like a straight amount. And I think it's kind of starting to put a, a real glitch on, on people trying to maintain their recycling and their trash and all this and keep, and you don't see the big bags in the, the ditches and stuff. But I think that's what you're gonna start seeing if uh, these increases mm -hmm. take place. Yep. Um, so we're gonna go back here uh, next month, have a discussion with our board, and we'll have to look at, not a, you know with the affidavit that's gonna help us, uh, obviously with the recycling rates, but uh, we're gonna have to look at some type of increase, uh, not a lot, just to uh, help balance things out. And then we're gonna review the rates for uh, senior citizens. We're not promoting anything right now. We're not um, you know, saying we're gonna increase fees or anything. I think it's worth a discussion on those fees uh, because there are concerns whether or not we're, we're being consistent with state law in terms of regulatory fees. So, uh, but I think back in July, we'll come back from recommendations of the board, but just wanna council be aware that you know, that's, that's coming down the road. Uh, that's part of life. We just gotta pay our bills. So, um, so um, that's on that. And there's any questions about the recycling? Sir, would you use our facility for no charge? Would you mind just coming to the microphone? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Just want to note that Marion residents will be able to continue to come up and use the resource recovery building. We're open Monday through Saturday, seven to four thirty. And in addition to the curbside recyclables, we also take hazardous materials for no charge from residents: old paints, chemicals, cleaners, batteries, fluorescent bulbs, and that will still be service available to Marion residents as being part of the 2080. Thanks. Thank you. Now, going back to Mr. Draper's question, um, I have been quiet lately. Uh, we're busy working on a project, um, and Councilman Draper asked me to go into that. I, I can, we're getting short on time, be happy to brief the council where we're at on some things, if you'd like me to, uh, Your Honor. Don't know if you wanna do it now, I can do it Thursday, I could do it at, you know, get through the agenda, <coughs> if you'd like, be happy to do it at the end, however you know, the council, if the council would like an update, I'd be happy to do that. Would anybody wanna update right now? Okay. Want to update right now? A few minutes now to do it? Yeah. A few minutes? It's yeah. going to take a few minutes. Okay. So that's fine. Okay. So um, as you know, we had a lot of projects in queue um, here a while back with fiber right and things like that. And part of those projects were to get to our goal of being a zero waste community. Um, we had some uh, disagreements with where that project was going. Uh, they partnered with the utilities. So um, regardless, we, we kept pushing forward with a project. And so these were some of the goals that uh, we sat down with our public services board and we really looked at. We want to start uh, really nailing these starting this year. And so one of the things we're going to do is finalize our plans for a, uh, a fueling facility. Council, I briefed the council on that. Uh, we do have some agreements finally in place to move forward with that. And in July, we'll, we'll come back to the council with a formal agreement. Uh, we do have a retail partner with that now. Um, also starting go to alternative fuels program. Uh, we've identified what we're gonna use for chassis, things like that. And again, we'll, we'll come back to the council and go through that. And then uh, one of the major things we wanted to look at is look at our solid waste collections program. Uh, we have an opportunity to really look at things, take a step back and really evaluate how we wanna do things. And we're not proposing to do anything now, but we have been evaluating pretty much everything under the sun. And then uh, finalize plans and, and submit to the council a proposal for a material recovery facility. Um, we are moving forward with that project still, unless the council doesn't want to, let me know. But uh, we do have some, uh, some interest in doing that. We have some very strong partners with that. So again, I'm gonna point out our, our current rates. We keep those very low and we're, we're happy with that. We're very aggressive about that. One of the reasons why those rates are low is that we're very efficient in our collections. We still do manual collections. Um, we're very efficient because we use a split hopper system. One side is solid waste, one side is recycling, okay? So that operator will go out, collect the solid waste manually well, well, on one side, and then obviously on the other side, he, he dumps the recycling. Very efficient system. And so we've been very slow at looking at anything else because we're very happy with that. The drivers are very happy with that. And so each driver, uh, they'll, go, they'll go out and they'll collect over 500 dwellings per day a lot of work, uh, they'll, they'll load up with between five and seven tons of material. And um, usually on a given day, we'll, we'll see five to seven routes um, 
And we see it in the citizen surveys. We have pretty good uh, ratings, 80 to 90 percent. And so the citizens see it, and the guys are very hard workers at doing that. So the biggest request we get is moving towards these larger bins, these rolly bins, okay? All the time, people come in, when are we going to go to this? When are we going to go to this? The reason why we've been very slow at looking at that is because um, it's very expensive to implement is one. And right now we have a very efficient system in place. That's another reason. When you go with those larger bins, you have to go to automated collections. And that's having a truck go around uh, rather than the individual picking up the trash can or what have you, a recycling bin, the arm does. And that's a picture of the arm. And uh, again, those are very costly to implement. But not, not only do you have to outfit the, the vehicles to do that, but you also have to buy the bins, distribute the bins for everybody to utilize. So there's some cost in that. So right now we have a very good opportunity to look at uh, reevaluating everything because uh, right now we're looking at new fueling systems, new chassis, as well as the, the fact that we could have a material recovery facility here in a short time. And so one of the things I promised a couple of my board members was to take a step back and look at a, a new way of doing things and getting rid of the old fashioned things and looking at a mixed bin collection program. And I think Mr. Draper, that's kind of what you're alluding to, but we can't advocate landfilling that material. Um, we have to get it out of there some way. So uh, that's one of the things we've been looking at. And the, the reason why we're looking at that is it's very efficient. Um, very efficient only to have one bin, dump it and go. Um, and it's also very e easy for residents and here in a little bit, I'll explain to you why it's even more efficient. So um, city of Muncie, they're in Indiana. We took a visit here back in March, wanted to look at their solid waste program, their collection program, they have a very, very good collection program, very similar to what we want to do. Um, the first thing they did is that they did switch to compressed natural gas, their whole fleet. Uh, and then with that, they also built a fueling station that allows the public to utilize. So that project alone cost them $6.2 million. They spent $3 million on a retail station, uh, $3.2 million on lease certificates, leasing the vehicles back. And then with that, they saw about a four to five year payback on the investment. Um, and then with that, they'll see about a million dollars in cost savings <coughs> after that, excuse me. Let's picture their truck. Um, it's an automated truck because they only have one bin that they collect. Um, and that's what their program emphasizes. Now, there's a little different. They have a blue bag um, that they put the recycling in, okay? And so rather than having a blue tote or a blue bin, you get these blue bags. The blue bags are free. So you just put the recycling in a blue bag. And we're not, we're not saying we're going to do this, but we're looking at a similar model. So in that blue bag, and you put all your recycling in, and then this big 96-gallon tote container, <coughs> you put everything else in, all your garbage and everything else. And so the reason why they see what it's very efficient is that each driver, rather than collecting 500 homes a day, they're collecting 1,200 homes per day. They're, they're still getting done at 1 p.m. They're still getting done early. Um, at the same time, they serve 35,000 customers. Their fee, their monthly solid waste fee is $5 per month. Their tipping fees are higher in Indiana than they are here. The reason why is they have a very, very efficient collection system. Now they do have a facility they can take it to, like a MRF, that allows them to separate out the recyclables in the blue bag, okay? And so regardless, it's a very, very efficient system. And we typically don't admit um, someone has a very efficient system more than we do because we're proud, but they do. They have a very efficient system. And so um, per 1,000 units or 1,000 houses, it costs them roughly $19,000 annually to serve those households in collections. In comparison with us, about 87000 so that's how efficient that system is in terms of collections. Very, very interesting. With that, um, we are looking at this. Our, our board wants to look at this very closely. It's a big change, a big shift in how we think. I'm, I'm all for recycling, but a big change in how we do things. Um, the reason being is that we want to look at extracting um, certain focused value recyclables. There's certain ones that we do want to go for. One is organics. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, number, another thing is the metals, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, and the plastics. Uh, we do have plastics in there we want to get out. We have a really neat project that we're currently working on or currently doing in uh, regards to the plastics. So um, with the biomass, uh, that's about 54% we want to take out, or the organics, I'm sorry. Um, and so a lot of that is 
is your solid waste, your biomass product like we talked about. Uh, then your ferrous metals, there's, a, there's some value in that, taking those out, as well as your plastics. Your plastics, there's some value there. Right now, not really, petroleum market's down, so we don't see a lot of value of our plastics, but uh, we do have a really, really neat project that we're working on uh, to do that. So, any questions up to this point on, in regards to that collection system? It's the collection system. Well, the only uh, negative thing I've ever heard has been from Cedar Rapids with these larger containers that, that uh, they were too difficult for older people to mo move into the, this street. We, yeah, and that was our concern uh, until we actually took the time to go out and talk to residents and uh, you wouldn't believe how nasty people get when you threaten to take those containers away. <laughs> they love them and uh, they're easy to roll down and I, we took the time to talk to citizens. We actually went out on a route, we collect, collected with them. Um, very, very neat system. Um, the, they have a higher approval rating than we do. Now that was not Cedar Rapids, that was no, Muncie. That's Muncie, okay. right. Uh, with Cedar Rapids, their system's a little different. They have three containers. Yeah. Uh, one's recycling, one's solid waste, one's air waste. Um, and so you have three different trucks that go around, collect those. With ours, what we look at is doing two separate containers, probably a yard waste and, and a solid waste container. What about glass? Glass goes in the one container. Any questions up to that point about that? Okay. Want me to keep going? Sir, Mayor, you okay? All right. So it's kind of where I left you, and I apologize for leaving in. One of the things we looked at was uh, how we're going to move forward with this, and I, I talked to you about the visit we had to Yellowstone Park, and how they, what they do out there is that they compost their garbage, and they do a very good job doing that. And so we talked about what that process is, and they use what they call a sear drum mechanism. Built in 1968, uh, works okay, not exactly what we want to do, I don't think, but a lot of the technology we're looking at that for organic separation, that's the only thing we want to get to. And you can see there's organic separation, you have all the, the organics of paper waste, um, what have you goes into that, then basically it's trauma off. The other is inorganics, and that those are potentially recyclable, those include your metals, and for us, we want the plastics. Uh, that's very important to us. And so one of the things we've been looking at says, okay, if we do this organics processing, what can we do with it? Well, one of the things we've been looking at is uh, compost. Very easy for us to do. Um, our partners uh, that we're working on this with also want to look at that because that is a very high value commodity. At least it can be if you know what you're doing with it. And so one of the things we looked at doing is pelletizing it. And we actually did this. Uh, we're actually pelletizing the biomass. And I did bring some samples if anybody wants to see it. But the reason why we look at this is because they have uh, people in other sectors of the country that utilize fertilizers, specifically organic fertilizers, that they're looking at agricultural applications of the compost. This gets really interesting, really cool, because I have an agricultural background. So a couple months ago, we talked about nitrate reductions uh, that we all have to realize part of our sanitary sewer program. We're going to look at those fees eventually. And Basically what that is, is that they want farmers to go to a no-till system. They don't want to till up the land because what happens, it rains and all the nitrogen gets washed away from the field, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the applications they're looking at this very, very close is rather than spreading fertilizer across the whole field, as most farmers do, uh, they're looking at getting to that seed, whatever that has, you know, beans, corn, or what have you. And so they came up with a system where they're pelletizing their compost and they're having very good luck putting that in the drill, and that's what it looks like. They're pelletizing their compost, and when they go out seeding their field, they put the pellet right next to the seed, and they're getting very, very good results. In fact, it's a very, very easy process, almost too easy to where more people are gonna start doing that. So the um, idea behind doing that is getting the fertilizer right next to the seed rather than spraying around the whole field. And so that's the company we've been working with is called Compel. Uh, they're doing this out in Washington State. Uh, they've had very good luck. They get about a 30% increase in yields uh, from what they're reporting. But with our partner group that we're working with, our investor group, they have other people that are interested in this. And they're very easy to do. We're actually pelletizing our compost right now. Um, and so not only can you do an agriculture application, the resident could also take it home and spread it in a spreader across their lawn if they really wanted to. So a lot of neat things with that. 
uh, plastics, we uh, were having a lot of fun with that. And so uh, we, uh, earlier this year, we, we uh, met a group to where uh, we actually want to look for a way to insulate our projects and to look at how we can address plastic. Plastic bags, the ones you get at the grocery store, those, those are a nightmare. Um, none of the recyclers really like those because it takes so much to really get um, a good amount of value out of there. There's no value in those plastic bags. You, you need so much to do that. And so that's what a plastic bag looks like, like after going through a system. It shrivels up really tight. And so this company, and I can't really talk about it, who it is publicly, they came up with some thermal cracking technologies. The young gal that's in the picture right there, very bright girl. Uh, she graduated from MIT at 16. She knows what she's doing. Um, but anyways, we sent our plastic there and we got a very good uh, lesson in how this works. This is called thermal cracking. So it's a high pressure, high heat uh, system that takes plastics, takes them back down to petroleum, and they take anything from polystyrene, that's what they use for styrofoam now. Okay, styrofoam is kind of a pain to deal with. Uh, take the polypropylene bags, that's your thin films, and then the polystyrene. Pretty much any plastics that you see in the re recycling brochure, one through seven, you can put in this system. Okay, and what they do with that is they make diesel fuel, very clean diesel fuel. And it's amazing on the process how easy and how cheap it is. And so um, we did that, we sent that uh, sample to them. That's the footprint of the facility. Um, 10 tons of plastics equals 2,500 gallons of fuel. So uh, very small footprint, very bright people. And then we have been running it in some of our designated equipment since. So since then we've been taking our ground up plastic Sending out there, they're, they're making it for this, and we're having a lot of fun with this until we move forward with our plans for a facility. So, any questions on that? Again, I got some samples over there if anyone wants to look at it. So, if you want to come out right around, let me know. <coughs> Keep going, let me stop. Run out of time. How much more do you have? A little bit, not much. Okay. To keep going? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't plan on doing this, but he asked. Well, that's fine. Okay. No, I've, we've all been wondering what's going on. So, uh, one of the, some of the technology that we're looking at, again, we talked about uh, organic <coughs> separation. One of the things we're looking at is autoclave technology. It's been around for years. Everybody knows what an autoclave is. It's basically uh, you introduce high temperatures, high steam into a rotating drum. That's it. Um, that's a picture at Fiberite. That's their autoclave uh, in operation over at, in the Virginia facility. They have a, an older one. Um, these are in hospitals. Uh, that one over on the left, that's in John Hopkins. And then this, this one down there, I think that's at the, uni I think that's the University Hospital. I'm not sure which one it is. And so we have been have, have been specifying uh, the size of autoclaves we would like to look at for such a facility. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. These are some very large autoclaves over in uh, United Kingdom over there. These are very common, okay? Those, I think, process 30 tons a piece per hour. Those are very large. Those are massive. Um, but some of the neat stuff with autoclaves is that we we're, we're have access to cutting edge technology. That's an autoclave. That's a continuous autoclave. Um, and so we're, we're working with people that really um, are on the cutting edge of this technology. It's been really neat to work with them. And so it doesn't take a lot of room to do this. So that little autoclave right there, that'll process about 15 tons per hour. It's 40 foot long by 15 foot by 15 foot, very small footprint. And so we're taking these models of the equipment we're getting back, we're putting them in two different types of facilities and what's going to happen is that I'm going to sit down to all the council members, we're going to talk about this individually, I'm going to come back, do a more formal presentation as well as do some formal proposals, that way everybody has a chance to ask questions, uh, we're going to go through this step by step, no risks, no nothing. So. Uh, we have two proposals that will be coming down the line, a regional facility that's very large, as well as a smaller restricted facility, okay? Regional facility looks like that, it's very big. Um, this is the proposal we got back from a Spanish engineering group. Uh, as, I can, as you can see, that's very large, very big footprint. Um, they can process up, up to 1,000 tons per day. Um, it can work, uh, but I think you need everybody in the region on board to really consider uh, something like that. But we do have a formal proposal to move forward with something like this. Just the scale and the diagram, if you see how big the, that silo, there's a semi sitting under it. That gives you a scale of uh, how big this facility is. And then we also have a more restrictive facility. We're looking at only 100 tons per 
day. For which if Marion wanted to pursue a zero waste goal, that would be more suitable. And in that, that type of facility, that's the equipment you're looking at. Uh, and it's hard to see, there's individuals standing by this, but only about 40 foot long by 15 foot high. Very smaller, much smaller equipment. So all of this information will be coming towards the council. Um, but that type of system right there, we can process up to 11 or 100 tons per day, which is more suitable for uh, the size of town we are without really sitting down with people in the region seeing if they want to move forward with this. So the size of facility you need from that is very, very small. Um, that's about the size of plant. That is one design um, that we're looking at, but you really don't need much of a footprint to go forward. So that's what we've been doing up to this point. And so after this, um, I'll be scheduling time with the council members to go through this part as well as some other parts. And if you got any questions to what we're doing, feel free to anytime call. We'll set up appointments, uh, take questions, concerns. Obviously, you know, we want to make sure everybody in the council is comfortable with even pursuing something like this. So it's a pretty big deal, but it's definitely within our grasp very, very easily. So, questions? It's like a bright future to me. Well, can, I, will, I will say with this project that we are in total control. We're in total control of timelines. We're in total control of everything. All the risks that we take, um, all the de-risking that we take, uh, there's some options here to consider whether or not the city, how much control you want over this. But um, with this type of project, it's, it, there's a lot more control uh, with moving forward. Um, before we worked with vendors, private vendors, where we didn't have a lot of control. We had to do what they wanted to do and that had to do it with their partners. This one we have control. We do have private people we're working with, so there's some flexibility. I want to introduce you to those people as well. So, uh, but we're, we're ready to uh, go forward with a formal proposal, and we'll be sitting down with each of you uh, to go over that. Okay? Okay. <coughs> well, well, thanks, Ryan. We'll with a smaller, uh, <laughs> smaller facility, would it support the, the service, the filling station for the compressed natural gas? So what we're looking at is not really taking organics to compress natural gas. Oh, you're not, that's not doing that. Yeah, potentially we have another project we'll talk to you about down the line. Okay. Um, I'm, we're not too worried about that part. Okay. Um, the compressed natural gas station, um, we have a really cool project put together for that. We're going to, July, when July comes back, we'll, we'll, we'll announce that. Okay. So but, that's um, not the byproduct of... Of this. No, that if we move forward with something like this, the diesel, you know, absolutely we can manufacture as much diesel fuel as we want um, because out of, out of one ton of plastic bags, we can get 250 gallons of diesel fuel or 10 tons, 2,500 gallons. So uh, that's a really neat process, really neat system. It's very inexpensive too and so very bright people on that. But we'll go over all of this and I'll be back over to give more of a formal presentation. So a lot of questions I know from the council where are we at with this stuff. How much competition is this with uh, private enterprise? In terms of? Well, diesel. I mean, you know, uh, fuel for vehicles. Like private, what do you mean private enterprise? As in terms well, of selling know, like, the? Like uh, the filling stations and the. So what we're coming back is a proposal. We're, we're partnering with a private entity to do this. On the retail side, is that your question? The are you talking about manufacturing the diesel? No, no, not manufacturing, but the selling of. If, selling. If the city will not sell fuel. Okay, oh, okay, so then this, this service station that you were talking the about. The service station will be privately operated. And strictly city vehicles? No, be open to the public. Ah, so therefore then it becomes a yeah. competition. Not necessarily competition. We're bringing in a private enterprise, a local private enterprise to do that. Okay. Okay. okay thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Ready? Please. Yeah. Just had one item on the agenda the, this afternoon. Uh, it's the uh, purchase of a truck and equipment from uh, Freightliner of Cedar Rapids. Uh, they were the low bidder for all equipment in the amount of uh, 129179 uh, uh, This is a, a FY16 budgeted item. The uh, budget for the truck and equipment uh, was $120,000. We're a little over that budgeted amount by about 7.5%. Uh, 
Um, typically, these uh, items would be approved by the park board, but because we are over the budget amount, it needs to come back uh, uh, before the council for approval. Um, and the park board is recommending approval of equipment as specified. Um, this is a, a 2017 uh, Freightliner uh, severe duty uh, chassis with a swap loader lift, uh, lift system on it and then a Henderson 11 foot dump box. Uh, what the uh, swap loader system uh, provides for is that uh, gives us the opportunity to interchange uh, equipment. Uh, currently, um, we have two roll-offs uh, that we use uh, for garbage collection in the park system. One is located at Alau Park, the other one down at Thomas Park. We borrow uh, equipment from public service uh, currently to uh, haul our uh, refuge to the landfill. Um, we also borrow our um, dump trucks from uh, Ryan and, at public service to do any type of park projects. This provides for a 11 foot dump box uh, as part of this. It gives the versatility with the swap loader system that uh, in the future, if we need uh, to add uh, a sander unit, uh, this truck can uh, carry that sander unit. Uh, if we need a flatbed uh, unit, uh, we can pull that up onto that uh, roll off system also. Um, a chipper box for uh, the forestry division if we have a storm or something like that. We can drop off a dump box or whatever unit we have on it, uh, pull up a chipper box in the future and put that on it. So it's a very uh, versatile unit. Uh, it also provides the opportunity that uh, public service uh, truck goes down or something like that and they need to move their roll offs. This would be a backup that, uh, uh, that the public service department could use also. So uh, again, the park board's recommending uh, approval to purchase, uh, purchase uh, for all equipment as specified. So you, say, you said we had this budgeted at 120? It was budgeted at uh, 120, um, so we are a little bit over the budget amount. Uh, I believe, Lon, that was going to come out of the 2016 GO bond, is that correct? Yeah, it's anticipated to be part of the uh, upcoming every other year bond issue. Okay, so it doesn't come out of the equipment replacement fund? As a new piece of equipment, no. Once this is in there, then Mike will adjust the amount that's getting allocated from his budget to equipment replacement every year so that when it comes time to uh, replace it 20, 25 years from now, we'll have the funds to do it. Okay. Did we understand that? Or questions on that? Well, actually not questions, but um, what this is, okay, you know, KitchenAid home type mixers, right? and you get all the different parts to attach to it, the bread maker and the paddles and all this. Well, this is kind of the, the equivalent of this piece of equipment because it's using one basic piece and then adding on. So uh, actually, it sounds like a pretty good deal. Very efficient for you know, Lightford Parks and Rec Department, um, you know, to have the build out capital investment of multiple trucks to do one single thing to where one piece of one chassis um, you can do multiple functions with. So so it's very efficient for us. See, I knew it had worked. Mike, where did you say where just in summary, where's the difference in the one twenty to one twenty nine? Uh, was it just in the bids? Was it did we miss a date for uh, from the manufacturer? Where where's the increase? Is it, most of the increase uh, from what we what I originally had budgeted for it comes on uh, the swap loader side, not so much the chassis. When I went back through looking at my estimates on what the cost of the the, the truck and, and unit would be, it, it is more on uh, the hook lift system side and the dump box side where the increases came from. Okay, so just a little bit of modification and more flexibility, yep. first of all. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So what's the the severe duty versus the alternate bid for 126? The, w between the severe duty and the medium duty uh, chassis that they gave that ultimate b alternate bid for, Joe, is that uh, a lot of it is uh, the severe duty trucks, they, they run off load, road a lot, uh, much uh, improved uh, filtration system for the engine uh, in the severe duty side of it. Uh, so that's one of those upgrade axle upgrades, those type of things in the severe duty since the, uh, versus the medium duty uh, chassis from what they were explaining to me. Mm -hmm. um, they can get us to uh, um, the 
uh, GVRW within that, uh, that uh, second bid. I just felt that with this vehicle spending probably half of its life off-road within the park system on parks project, I thought it was better if we went with the severe duty and kept uh, close to what the actual specifications were written for. Okay. Thank you. Will this truck see a dual use between public service and parks or will it be solely your truck? No, I have, you know, uh, from my standpoint, you know, the piece of equipment there is, is there to use. If we have a storm uh, and Ryan needs another truck to, to go out and load materials with, whatever, it's there available for that. Just like what we've been doing now for years, that uh, if we need a, a piece of equipment at parks, you know, Ryan, you know, we just get all there and we schedule a time to use that. So it will be shared between uh, departments. I don't want to speak for Ryan, but... No, we've had times where our, um, Mike talked about a hook truck, where we have those roll-off dumpsters. Um, if that hook truck goes down, we have no means to pick up those dumpsters. So we have a dumpster, let's say we have this, you know, a festival, a Swamp Fox Festival, and all of a sudden our truck goes down. Sorry, so it's good to have redundant equipment that can perform the same routine, and it's a very flexible piece of equipment. So, And we do share, we do share quite a bit. I guess where I was headed is it would, the, the overage that you're seeing maybe come out of public service budget. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. I, well, you stepped right into that one, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I we was, do share. Well, we give do me share, more. Right? Give me more. <laughs> Most, most of the time we've been the winner on that uh, versus the public service department. I think it's our, our turn maybe to step up and, and purchase the piece of equipment. Well, maybe we can put red and blue lights on it and send it over to <laughs> Yeah, your way. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want in on that? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Thank you.